We are taking you behind the scenes of the National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. With unprecedented access to the scientists pushing boundaries and shaping our future, this show will take you to the cutting edge and beyond. And whether you're an expert yourself or just science curious, this is the show for you. Welcome to the Turing Podcast. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Turing Podcast. Today on the podcast, we're joined by Dr. Subo Majumdar, who works at as a senior applied scientist at Splunk in the United States, and Prithvi Pramanik, who is a visiting Fulbright doctoral fellow at the University of Illinois and PhD fellow at the National Institute of Technology, Durgapur in India. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Christina Last, here at the Alan Turing Institute, uh, who has worked uh, with them to talk about a project they worked on that involved assessing the exposure of children to air pollution in the light of COVID lockdowns. So Subo, Prithvi and Christina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, nice thanks, Ed. Yep, thanks, Ed. <laughs> just to, just to uh, clarify, Christina, this is the second time you've appeared on the podcast and um, your usual role is a, as a host, although today we're actually talking about a project you've worked on. So perhaps uh, before I go to the other two, do you want to... Um, tell our listeners a little bit about your background and how you came to work on this particular project before you worked with us at the Alan Turing Institute. Yeah, it's actually my third time on the podcast. So oh, I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really racking them up in quite a short space of time, um, which, yeah, has been really, really fun. And, you know, it's uh, going to be interesting for the next hour sitting on the other side of the table. Um, so, yeah, basically, how did I come uh, to meet Prithvi and Subo and work on this project. Um, so I guess in the, well, at the start of the COVID-19 lockdowns, um, most people had kind of, were, were severely concerned with the situation and wanted to help out. And uh, kind of my skills as a, as a geographer, but also a kind of a budding data scientist meant that I really wanted to combine those skills in a certain way and came across a volunteering organization that was not specifically about COVID-19, although they had uh, a large amount of volunteering projects that you could um, get involved with uh, that, that were concerned with changes occurring because of COVID-19. Um, and I uh, was actually um, approached by one of the members of the uh, volunteering community. They're called Solve for Good. Uh, and they actually came out of um, a collaboration between, I think, the University of Chicago and um, the Alan Turing Institute as well. Uh, and uh, they formally ran a kind of official um, volunteering program called Data Science for Social Good. Um, that's like a six week long, um, I guess, internship that, sh that uh, kind of global scholars would go to Chicago uh, for six weeks to work on kind of socially beneficial data science projects. Anyway, because of the COVID situation, uh, that was transformed into this kind of open source global volunteering project that was remote first. Um, so I applied uh, through Soul for Good uh, and yeah, was approached by one of their members to work on this kind of geospatial project with UNICEF. I didn't really know what it was about, but then we managed to kind of rally a good team who had expertise in um pollution modeling and um, in general kind of highly experienced people in data science to to work on basically looking at exposure um, of uh, child populations globally to find particulate matter uh, and that was basically because UNICEF uh, that was the organization uh, who wanted to work on this project with Soul for Good they were really interested in uh, looking at how that had affected uh, child exposure because of the lockdowns um, but also how they could better use this kind of these kind of data sets to drive some of their interventions uh, in their regional offices and, and we partnered with a few regional offices um, but yeah it was basically a volunteering role I really wanted to do something during the COVID lockdowns and um, yeah this was seemed like a good way to learn my skill set. Yeah it was, it was a difficult time for everyone and I think um, a lot of people in the scientific community were wondering whether they had an a an official opportunity to do so or not how they could use their skills to you know make a difference at, at that time um but um yeah before we get dive deeper into the research um uh, let me go to our other two guests so uh prithvi um 
where uh, tell, tell us about your background um how you came to work on this project um and, and what area of uh, research you have a background in it was something similar to what christina said on how i got introduced to solve for good program as well so i was looking for something to do in my lockdown and uh, by training i have been working on uh, air quality so my my primary research has been uh, in and trying to understand city level air quality you know like my research takes a data driven approach to understand the state of air quality across a city through multimodal data sources um, like uh, federal monitoring stations state monitoring stations low cost uh, monitors across the city as well as quantify reports from social media so that we can have critical downstream tasks such as uh, mapping the impact of health from uh, air so that uh, and we can actually uh, have people uh, like understand what is happening uh, from from air and uh, and somehow quantify that so it 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 involved the problem of how uh, sensors need to be placed across uh, the space uh, by space i mean across the city so that we can have a true representation uh, of the level of pollution across the cities and and we also need to understand the resources or that is the number of sensors are finite so we need to find an optimal way to do that but at the same time ensure that the data quality is intact so when we um, like when we are doing such a uh, uh, taking such an approach uh, like we are also not just measuring places where we just have sensors but also expanding to areas where we do not and formally we are trying to take different statistical and machine learning methods to uh actually reduce this errors uh, in the places where we do not have sensors so that that was my background and what was uh, what i was trying to do or that that is my goal in my uh, doctoral research so i found the work unicef uh, tried to do in a global scale very relevant so when uh, i kind of approached the team we had a chat about it so the the, uh, the from the partner side that is from unicef we had uh, someone uh, who was a geospatial expert who could uh, talk about what they want and something they wanted something along these lines for the uh, regional offices as well so that if they have some form of data whether they can augment the data to a say a global model and come up with a uh, ways to you know measure the impact of uh of uh, the the impact on the health of children in the region so it seemed like a perfect fit and we all started working on that nice there's a lot of overlapping interests there um yeah so let's go to subo now uh, how did you uh get involved in this project and, and what's your background my background is in statistics mostly to begin with i have, I have a bachelor's in statistics master's in statistics then a phd in statistics but um, in terms of work i like to live in that intersection area of stats machine learning data science ai whatever you call it and i think that we are all working with data so we should we should all work together <laughs> and uh, specifically i like the applied aspect of things and more specifically uh, in the data for good slash ethical ai kind of work where you don't uh, you are not only looking to profit from machine learning or data science applications but you are actually doing something good uh, in some sense to advance the society to make people's lives better uh so that was my bigger motivation uh that has been my bigger motivation in my work uh and uh, for the data for good space i was actually involved with the dssg initiative that christina talked about that uh, our uh solve for good platform was a part of uh i did a fellowship with them back in 2014 when i was a second year grad student um and i really liked that experience that kind of opened my eyes up to what really goes into the implementation of real life data science projects like 
the, it involves a lot of stakeholder interaction, a lot of um, data cleaning, uh, a lot of dirty stuff, so to speak. Um, so yeah, that got really got me interested in it, and that project actually went somewhere. Uh, it got uh, published. It got funded later on as a full blown project. It was a collaboration with um, the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, so yeah, after that, when the lockdown happened, as just like Christina mentioned, I was looking for something to do uh, in the summer time specifically because there was not much uh, to do outside or there was not much, uh, not many chances to go outside. So basically I was looking for something and uh, chanced upon this thing that uh, DSSG went online and they're like uh, expanding their reach, soliciting uh, help from people all over the globe. And yeah, that's why I uh, talked to them. I said that, hey, how can I help? And then got connected to the team, uh, Christina and others. Um, I think it was Christina and a couple of other people who were already scoping out the project, talking with the stakeholders, CNSF people, uh, gathering the data requirements and all that. Seemed really interesting. Uh, seemed like it could go, uh, it, it had legs. So yeah, that's why I thought that, okay, uh, let's work on this. And uh, yeah, fortunately it turned out really well. We got some really good feedback thanks to the work of the team uh, from our UNICEF stakeholders, the data scientists and domain scientists over there. And yeah, uh, got good feedback from DSSG as well. And everything, touch wood, seems to go well. So I think, yeah, that's in short my own story and uh, the story of my mm. involvement with this project. So is um, this organization, it's uh, Data Science for Social Good. Am I getting that correct? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And um, maybe, um, yeah, for our listeners, could you tell us a bit about, about them and, um, yeah, what, what do they do? What kind of organization are they? So Data Science for Social Good, as far as I know, was started back in 2013 um, by Raid Khani, who has been uh, the head of data science efforts in the Obama 2012 campaign before he kind of started uh, on this journey of data science for social good. And I think it was one of the first, very first efforts in the data for good space to actually do something concrete to leverage uh, open source uh, and nonprofit data to uh, build models that solve uh, real life problems or at, at least build prototypes of such models. And uh, Raid started it uh, back then and it was just the fellowship uh, for the first few years, I think. But uh, after the first three, four years, uh, some satellite efforts, uh, which which got motivation from and also collaborated with Raid and his team, uh, started in other uh, institutions across the US and across the world as well. And that movement, I think, has expanded quite a bit right now. And DSSG, Raid moved to CMU since, you know, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And... Uh, I think for the last two years or so, the actual internship was not there, but the, the satellite efforts did continue, like Solve for Good. And I think this summer, they are again um, starting to do an in-person uh, in or hybrid virtual. I'm not sure which one, but the internship program is starting, restarting again. So, yeah, overall, uh, that's, uh, yeah, it, it has been, uh, there, have been, there has been a lot of different types of, collaborative projects that they have handled. And I think as a person, Raid knows a lot about uh, what are the challenges, how can we go from ideation to implementation in these kind of situations where you don't really have that much of a, a profit motivation and in the sense that uh, uh, there there are not many people who are ready to throw money at you, to, to speak frankly. And so you really need to prioritize that, okay, these are the things that we need to do or these are the things we need to do to convince um, critical stakeholders and uh, so, so that the pro project can progress from uh, in that next phase of implementation. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear. I mean, um, at the Alan Turing Institute, like we're, we're obviously very interested in this kind of, you know, uh, research projects that are for social good and things like that. So it's always great to hear about um, examples of that from from elsewhere in the world, and um, especially when they they link up with our our um, current colleagues like Christina. So, <laughs> so um, that's that's um, that's all very interesting. So, um, yeah. So now to talk about yeah, sort of the research and what you guys have done. So, um, I think the, the the topic, in a sense, needs no introduction. We've 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 mentioned it a little bit already. Most of our 
I think every single one of our listeners will be very aware that there was this thing called the COVID-19 pandemic that has obviously affected the whole world and, and all of us and that many of the countries in the world have, uh, um, in response to that, had uh, these lockdowns, which were the emergency measures to con- contain the pandemic. Um, but um, perhaps uh, one of the news stories, in, especially in the UK in the early lockdown that I remember, was that the because there was so little traffic and um, everyone was at home, that the uh, the air quality was like noticeably improving and and al- and almost like and that wasn't the only thing you know it was also you know like there were wild sheep roaming the streets of Wales and <laughs> and things like that. Um, but yeah, what can you tell us about the um, how the lockdowns uh, affected the quality of air? Um, who 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 wants to take that question? <laughs> Yeah, I can I can start. I think Prithi can probably fill in um, fill in some of the gaps, um, and I'll like I'll talk through a little bit about our approach as well, um, because we were seeing all of these news stories as well, and there was a genuine curiosity from a researcher's perspective whether those were consistent, like whether we were actually seeing um, like higher quality of air in urban areas because of you know, changes in shifting travel behavior and just generally like industrial, like factories closing down or shortening their hours. Um, and we wanted to see like whether that was actually translating into improved health outcomes in particular, because we were getting also affected by a respiratory disease at the same time. So if there was, if there was any possibility of decoupling those effects, um, that was obviously a reach goal. Um, but we also, um, and we also, I guess, from the UNICEF point of view, they were interested in actually developing a model, so a global model of pollution, taking into account these changes in travel behavior, but also looking at the fact that we had this change in historic data, so meaning historic data was kind of useless to predict current pollution because of travel behavior shifting, and also the fact that we have very unequal distribution of uh, air pollution sensors across the world. Uh, in particular, areas where you know UNICEF have operations are areas where, unfortunately, there aren't a large amount of ground sensors. So a kind of byproduct of some of the research that we were doing was actually making connections with local researchers and startups in areas where they were operating with UNICEF regional offices to see if we could get some better quality information about uh, the pollution on the ground. Um, in terms of results, like we had some initial results from our global model. So we built this uh, machine learning model that took in kind of uh, hybrid data sets, both from satellite imagery and from the ground station data that we did have available. Um, and I think Prithvi can talk a little bit more about this, but um, we did actually see, you know, some significant changes in PM 2.5. So this is like particulate matter of certain diameter. Um, which is really bad because it's very small, gets into the lungs. Um, We saw some levels of um, like a decrease in um, pollution in in certain urban areas and and the exposure to child populations. We also saw, and comparing to the stringency index, which was a thing that was created during the COVID-19 pandemic, which talked about the kind of stringency of the government response. So that's like how severe lockdowns or interventions were. Uh, and there was kind of this, yeah, uh, like negative correlation. As soon as stringency was increased, then the PM 2.5 concentrations were increased in, uh, decreased in certain um, uh, countries that we were able to kind of gather that information from. Um, so that was a really interesting thing that kind of validated the fact that, like, as soon as you get a lockdown, then in that country there is going to be lower pollution levels. Um, but we also did see some surprising results that we're still trying to validate, which was actually if you look at incredibly high uh, concentrations, so there is um, there is concentrations over a certain amount, um, which we actually saw increase in certain areas, uh, and that we hypothesize about, although this is definitely yet to be validated, could be due to um, the fact that because there was a lot more residential uh, while well, people were staying at home uh, in, in certain kind of developing urban environments, um, it was likely that there was a lot more pollution introduced into residential areas. And so the exposure was actually increasing there. And I'm thinking of things like 
kind of internal stoves um, that produce a lot of PM 2.5, and just in ge general, like maybe more incineration of um, of waste uh, happening closer to home rather than maybe in an area that um, was less close to residential areas, uh, which was basically the kind of data set we were using as a proxy for exposure, um, whether it was residential and the population concentrations in uh, certain geographic locations. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a whistle stop through our results. Does anyone else want to chip in? Yeah, I mean, um, most of the things, uh, like it, it was kind of pretty self-explanatory like when you don't have automobiles pollution is supposed to go down right but then again we saw these kind of anomalies where the pollution is increasing in certain areas and uh, the, the, and it, those kind of things actually raises a lot of questions like what are the things that are happening so and I, I feel like those kind of events like uh, the the general trend was the pollution is decreasing, like nature is reclaiming itself, like you mentioned, sheep in some places in Venice, I think dolphins were seen, uh, you know, like in the canals and everything. So, but but uh, at the same time, uh, there are regions where the pollution is getting increased or pollution is remaining constant. Human beings didn't disappear. We just were in a different place. <laughs> we went to a different place, right? And. Yeah, the, the, the industrial output went down for a lot of places around the world and that that kind of actually had a huge impact on the pollution going down and like and it was one of the first experiment you can say in a global scale where we can see the impact when the when automobiles or industrial outputs are going down because we have not seen something along the lines in in maybe the last 200 300 years so that this this was kind of a huge moment from the perspective of air quality and, and its impact like we can say for sure or at least you know like with certain confidence that if if we decrease something it can actually decrease the level of pollution so that that was a very important takeaway yeah and it's it's interesting that um given the relatively short time frames of like how fast lockdowns were implemented and so on that there were so that there was a noticeable difference in pollution like relatively quickly um you know it's i i suppose yeah i, I mean I'm not being very scientific here but it kind of makes sense that if you're talking about something like air pollution and the air is always moving around you know we have weather that if you stop emitting that then things change quite quickly um, but I but I also had a question which was um, you were mentioning earlier about the disparity in sensor sensor coverage across the world. So how did you think about that in 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 terms of your own research and how that factored into the kinds of um, uh, decisions you had to make about how to treat the data? That's a very important and interesting question because you know like. When we are talking about measuring anything, we always need to have something uniform, right? But when we are, oftentimes when we are measuring about, uh, measuring air quality or talking about uh, pollution in a city, we do not say like how the sensors were placed. So often there is a disparity in how they are measured, like currently, uh, I will, I'm doing a, a research uh, project in Chicago where we are using the bus shelters as 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 a as a place where we can place uh, the, this uh, air quality measuring nodes. And the question is, which bus shelters do we use? Like, there are thousands of bus shelters. Can we use all of them? Of course not, because it's it's a very costly proposition. So. Get, say, we have a small set, say 100, 200 nodes. So where do we place them? So oftentimes it has been seen that uh, there are discriminations in the sense that uh, richer neighborhoods get more sensors. I mean, I mean that is kind of self-explanatory because you you have more funding there, so people are placing more sensors and trying to understand the impact. While 
in 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 this kind of segregations we do not have the true representation like then what what is happening to the other parts where there are not enough sensors so the idea is to understand the city in such a way that the coverage of the sensors are uniform that is we are able to measure the city in a uniform fashion that like both like whatever places or whatever variations there are we are able to cover them so in that case what we did like uh, we took a stratified approach there where we are taking an account for the population density as well as uh, the uh, the traffic count which is a major proxy for you know like air pollution measurement and then trying to distribute the sensors in a uniform way but there can be improvements over this as well which which i am currently looking at where while we are accounting for the different you know like like land use land cover and uh, things like that so that it's not just about the vehicle pollution we are able to account for the other significant sources of pollution as well so yeah i mean it's a very difficult question and there's no one answer to you know like solve this problem like what can work for chicago might not work for london might not work for kolkata so we have to figure a way because it is very dependent on the structure of the city and catering to that is very critical because there are different local characteristics as well like starting from urban heat canyon or lake effect and things like that so how to figure those things out and then intri- intri- integrate them together to form a generalized model that 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 can be something amazing yeah the um the issue of uh, sensor placement i know is something that's has come up in um, um, we have our own uh, clean air project at Turing and I think even um, within cities and I mean you said this yourself but um, you know the it tends to be the sort of richer areas that have more sensors placed Um, and that sort of like would be obvious between countries right I mean like some countries are just going to have the research projects and the funding to do them and they'll have better air, you know, quality coverage. But um, it, it's really sort of um, almost a, li- a little bit shocking that, that within a country and within a city that uh, there will be such a difference within um, the same city. Um, but yeah, it's, it's inter- interesting that, that across yeah, different work research projects we're, we're finding that same issue. Um, it's definitely certainly something to to think about for the for future researchers, especially if we're considering the uh, the ethics of research and uh, topics of that nature. What Prithvi mentioned is definitely a few of the some most of the challenges in uh, that specific domain. And in our um, project, I think we also observed that there is a lot of disparity in prediction quality based on what location you are predicting in. And I think if it would be interesting as a postdoc analysis at least to see that whether that prediction quality um, correlates with the scarcity or availability of data. And the second point, I think, which is uh, very important and uh, in uh, in a sense very challenging as well, is that uh, the issue of equity or fairness as far as spatial data is concerned. Um, so, yeah, as Prithvi mentioned, it, it will come up whenever you are analyzing some spatial data and on about people or people's activities. And uh, I've been uh, working in the algorithmic fairness uh, domain uh, for the last couple of years. And actually, there is no known solution for that. Uh, so, yeah, some of my own research work is in that area. We kind of proposed a way of measuring uh, demographic bias while accounting for the under, underlying spatial autocorrelation. But yeah, I mean, the work in that is still infancy. Our own work is ongoing and we do not know any other work that is happening in the specific domain. And we got the same feedback from reviewers and everywhere that, yeah, it is interesting and very challenging work. Mm, okay, interesting. So it's like, it's not 
certainly i mean the the obvious thing is, is to be like ah oh, damn those scientists not caring about the people in the <laughs> the poor areas but clearly that's not the case it, this is a hard problem to solve and it's and it's one that comes up and again demographic inequity stems from historical reasons uh, social reasons and they are right, like really intercorrelated you cannot separate one from the other or other it's difficult that the reason people get people from different backgrounds get segregated into different parts of a certain geographic area and that kind of is in its own feedback loop so whenever you want to measure uh, some effect out of data collected from those uh, people or those geographic areas it's difficult to decouple mm. these two absolutely yeah um yeah so i wonder if um we can talk a bit now about um the some of the results of your research and um uh, obviously the the thing that you were focusing on was um uh, children's health so could uh, could do you talk a bit about a bit more about this and um perhaps what some of the findings were um with regard to the covid lockdowns and how this affected children's health so i can talk a little bit about some of the results um but we were looking so a caveat of this is that we were looking at exposure and kind of one thing that we're really interested in now and there's again these we're running up against issues around what is the best way to quantify how exposure to uh, pollutants can actually affect health especially in children because um, the metrics that we have now I don't know if uh, listeners will be familiar with but they're of these acronyms called qualies and dallies which are kind of uh, daily adjusted life years and quality adjusted life years which is a really long way of explaining basically how um, exposure to a certain thing iteratively throughout your life will end up affecting um, the number of years you live um, and so we we those are the kind of gold standard slash like currently accepted metrics in the research um, but they kind of quite reductive because how how does it affect a child when their their life is basically fully ahead of them and are there other metrics that we could look at that would be more indicative of the effects that they're having in the short term as well as the medium term as well as the long term so that was a bigger question that we had with some researchers at unicef who were looking at that specifically um but our project was looking at kind of exposure and the way that we um reported back on this is um, there's some really interesting kind of derived data sets coming out of satellite imagery, um, which is using things like nighttime light to identify um, population concentrations globally. And uh, nighttime light is basically the kind of amount of uh, activity happening in urban areas uh, at nighttime. And it's much easier to you know, spot those areas when it's dark because they, they light up and, and satellites can capture that. Um, and then also overlay, so deriving from that, basically kind of uh, classifications of uh, how many people within certain age groups are going to be in certain areas of those cities. And so there's some interesting derived data that was provided to us by UNICEF on child population density uh, with, with, with this in mind. Uh, and so we looked at the intersection of basically areas that were uh, above uh, 10 parts per million. So this is kind of one of the WHO's standards of uh, pollution uh, and they say exposure to over 10 parts per million this is of pm 2.5 uh, for a given year is is going to be damaging to health um, they also give another um, metric and that's 25 parts per million so that's even higher than 10 and that's and they say if exposure to uh, that amount in 24 hours so not just a year but a day that's going to be damaging to your health um, and so we kind of did a, a kind of catch-all analysis of um, the, the kind of number of people from this uh, child population density map exposed to um, our predictions of over 10 parts per million and 25 parts per million um, before and after lockdown events. So we chose some dates that represented um, those two dates. Uh, and we actually saw kind of significantly... Um, different things for those two exposure ratings um so i kind of talked about it a little bit earlier but we had this kind of lower um threshold of the 10 part per million 
Uh, in all countries that we looked at, so we had data for Colombia, Indonesia, Niger, Peru, Sierra Leone, and Vietnam, uh, all of those had decreased. So the child population was exposed uh, to that amount of um, parts per million, that concentration, that decreased in all those countries. Um, and that's because, you know, in general, the background level was reducing um, because travel was basically halted. Uh, and we do look at like whether there was a harsh lockdown within those countries as well. Um, but as I said before, exposure to above um, 25 parts per million, so the kind of super high levels of pollution, actually in some countries that increased. So in Indonesia, for example, um, child population exposure to the like super high concentrations was increased. And, and the, yeah, the theories behind that are like, well, we maybe need to look at the model again. Um, because that could be erroneous, there might not be enough sensors that we can validate our results for in Indonesia, but it also could be because of this kind of localized pollution sources that were actually increasing the exposure in those communities rather than just the background level. So um, thinking about the what you mentioned earlier, the sort of quality adjusted life years, um, I, 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 I guess what you're saying is that's not quite what you were measuring this time, but um, what? so what what do you think is the most in interesting finding of, of this research and is when it comes to things like the quality adjusted life years was the time frame of the you know the difference in you know levels of pollution just too small for you know being within one year and you know month to month whether it was lockdown or not maybe an interesting finding is that discrepancy in the high pollution scenarios um, that we were seeing, uh, aka, you know, in, in extremely high concentrations, we saw both increases and decreases. Further validation of whether that actually happened is going to be useful. And um, because exposure, so the World Health Organization say exposure to that level of pollution concentration for a 24 hour period is damaging, um, then actually quantifying whether that happened for a continued amount of time um, would actually probably show some significant impact on child health. Um, and if we could validate those results, um, actually being able to uh, talk to the regional offices of UNICEF in those areas and seeing if they're seeing increased um, kind of respiratory problems, acute respiratory problems within children could actually be a good way of kind of, um, you know, uh, qualitatively validating the results and and definitely saying that maybe they should target interventions in 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 those specific regions um more in the future yeah building up on what christina said like one one important factor is like now that we have some kind of measurements it, it will be very interesting to compare those results with the uh, local offices you know like before that we did not have enough so, uh, any any you can say minimal minimum viable product we can you know showcase or show them to understand that this is the current scenario but now that we have that it, it'll be a very interesting way to have an open dialogue on that and uh, in fact like when we ha were having our you know like uh, a discussion session with the UNICEF partners they seemed very interested and it'll be very interesting to see how it follows up you know like there are uh, country offices in uh, uh, in South America who are very very uh, kind of active in these roles but again like implementing this in real life is also always a, a time consuming thing and it requires resources as well so that is something that needs to be looked into and uh, other than that uh, i would say another interesting thing is like since since this this was a multi layer approach you know like we are thinking of something global and then moving towards a local approach and you know like integration of different kinds of data together to form a model that was pretty interesting for me one of the broader goals i think uh, that we started with uh, was to design data driven policy interventions and uh, so the idea was that okay there is covid lockdown so let's measure the effect of that and see that what outcomes come out and 
by being informed by those outcomes, how can we tweak those policy interventions? So I think that's a more general point that we could at least start thinking about based on the findings of our study. Uh, just to give an example, as Christina mentioned, we saw that uh, there might be a pollution level uptick in residential areas as far as um, lockdowns are concerned. So I think that's that could be an opportunity of tweaking um, lockdown strategies as far as high level policies are concerned. And I think that's those are some of the larger data driven points that we can take home that, OK, these this model gives us a few interesting things to discuss with local officials, whatever country that may be in. And based on those discussions in the next iteration of the model, maybe maybe by incorporating local data sources, maybe by incorporating domain knowledge, we can kind of get a better sense of what is exactly happening and how can we make things better, both, both in terms of the quality of life of people and the policy decisions that go behind this continuous adjustment of everything uh, in, that is going on in, uh, as far as so, the society and uh, decisions are concerned. Well, one thing that's interesting about this, of course, is that clearly air pollution was a pre-existing problem, and it's just happened to be that, that we've had this unusual event from the point of view of air pollution with the lockdowns but um, when you're thinking about how that time period has affected uh, people's health or children's health specifically of course one thing that might be difficult is that if air pollution is having a negative impact on respiratory health well, we, of course, we also know that the COVID-19 uh, is having a negative impact on respiratory health. So um, is, it, is it possible to sort of untangle those things when you're trying to think about um, sort of using the uh, lockdowns as a control for, you know, being a, a, a low air pollution scenario? Yeah, I think we had uh, discussed that specific question that, OK, um, is there a correlation between uh, respiratory health caused by COVID, respiratory health quality uh, deterioration caused by COVID-19 and the respiratory health quality uh, deterioration caused by pollution? And uh, at this point, I think uh, what we need is data regarding the COVID part of things. What we have done until now is just taken air quality data, land, land cover, and geospatial data to analyze and build uh, machine learning models based on only those data sources. But I think if we can get uh, some amount of public health data, data, and of course that will again depend on the local level, uh, what data sources are available at the local level and their accuracy. And we can augment our global predictions with those local factors. I think that's a very promising next step. Yeah, I'm sure Prithvi, Christina, you guys have more to add. I, I had a, uh, a, a separate question then I was going to come to later, but um, we can go for it now. Um, I was uh, wondering about um, how this project was related to uh, citizen science. Um, I know citizen science is almost, I don't know if it's, you call it a buzzword, but it's, it seems to be something that's being talked about a lot now. And I guess it's um, where you're getting members of the public to somehow be involved in data collection or um, some other aspect of the research process. So was that something that was uh, part of this research? So citizen science, as we all know, like where, you know, like normal people or the citizen of, 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 of the country or of any region are interested in, you know, like expanding a certain section of science or contributing uh, to, to something. Though we have seen this more in, in say, ecology or something like that, identifying different species of butterflies or something like that. But now with the ubiquitous avail availability of air quality sensors, a lot of times we can see that people are actually buying the sensors and making this data available. So there are some specific uh, companies uh, like where this data can be directly accessed through their portals or sometimes even uploaded to say, uh, like open air quality repository, like OpenAQ. So, so we used OpenAQ data set for getting the ground-based sensor measurements throughout the world. So 
some of these measurements of, uh, invariably turn up uh, and that actually helped in the measurement. But yeah, at the same time, we have to talk about data quality, right? Like, so that those are some aspects that need still need to be worked on, you know, like, like how to validate data. Like, you don't have enough data to compare data. Is with. there a trade off between, I guess, data quantity and data quality here, where the more sort of non experts you have um, collecting the data, the the more the higher the quantity and but then you have to consider the quality it's honestly very difficult to say like i've seen in certain cases federal sensing uh, you know mechanisms which might be questionable while <laughs> while there are you know like of course when we are talking about uh, you know low cost sensing and things like that it, it's 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 a huge trade off where you are accounting uh, you are trying to in Increase the coverage at the at the cost of accuracy, but you can kind of see that okay, we did not need that amount of accuracy. Perhaps maybe if it's off by one or two percent, it's fine. But if it's varying by fifty, sixty percent, maybe that's a different story altogether. So, and that also depends on various other you know constraints as well, like say like physical constraints in the sense that maybe it's relative humidity or the temperature which 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 can cause problems in these kind of measurements okay interesting yeah but it's interesting to know that there are these kinds of initiatives out there that um especially in the world of air pollution it certainly makes sense as a sort of thing that people could uh contribute their own data to um so um, I think I'll, I'll ask uh, one sort of uh, final question then before we sort of wrap up. Um, we, we talked a little bit at the start about doing uh, research projects for like social good. And, you know, this is clearly an example of that. Um, but, um, you know, at Turing, we're often thinking about the, you know, ethics of research projects and in particular those that are related to AI. So I was wondering... Um, could any of you comment on that, like how AI and research ethics um, comes into play here? So there are, in general, bigger ethical questions, uh, specifically questions related to uh, whether algorithms are affecting or the uh, underlying mechanism is affecting underrepresented groups in the population and how to mitigate that and making sure that the AI is not uh, making the situation even worse. Uh, in in all of these applications. So one good thing about data for good applications is that, okay, these are geared towards the good of people. So that uh, chance is lower, but we still need to make sure, for example, going back to our uh, sensor example, uh, we, we should make sure that, okay, uh, when, what areas we are getting uh, bad quality prediction predictions in and making sure that uh, prediction quality is not interlinked to the underlying population demographics or at least minimizing that chance kind of taking post hoc efforts to reduce that i think those are some of the bigger considerations that might need to be addressed and the second the other thing is that uh, so there has been this separate discussion about machine learning ethics and trustworthy machine learning for the last four or five years which mainly started from uh, researchers in the computer science community. So it has been a mostly technical conversation that is right now starting to be more open-ended. And I think uh, that conversation can learn a little bit about this other interdisciplinary stream of work that has already been there, the data science for social good kind of movement, which has been to collaborate with uh, government or non-profit agencies to build data-driven solutions for societal problems in general. And I think this line of work has taken a more kind of inclusive approach in solving such problems. And the machine learning ethics community, as they are starting to apply the solutions they have developed for algorithmic fairness, for machine learning explainability, for robustness, as they are starting to work with actual real stakeholders who actually have the data to implement these solutions, 
they can learn from the experiences of this uh, other side of things, the data for good side of work, that how can we uh, build uh, effective solutions that actually go on to make people's lives better. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, the, I, I, I want to give a shout out for Trustworthy ML, which is Subo's community, and he also runs... <laughs> I know you don't want to do it, so I'll do it. Um, but yeah, they run bi-weekly seminars as well. So um, definitely have like a really awesome cast of people talking uh, on those. And um, it's really good to see like so many organizations involved and, and kudos to you running it and like having your first birthday the other week. Um, and also, I think, yeah, on, on the modeling side, like there's a whole discussion around that. But it's also, I mean... As we've seen recently, we've been running this um, data science course. Uh, we're teaching a data science course at the Turing, and and half of data science is the communication aspect with a, a, a project coordinator who may or may not be technical, may may like have no idea what machine learning actually does or, or how it's implemented. Uh, so there's definitely an aspect on the on the, on the kind of logistical project coordination side of com communicating results effectively and um, being able to communicate uncertainty around certain um, certain outcomes that they uh, and also uh, where the metrics are appropriate like the metrics that you define with a with a PI are actually appropriate to solve the challenge that you want to solve um, and they're all kind of communication as well as the technical um, challenges and I suppose that feeds back into the data providers and the the collectors of data in the first place because if these, uh, if you're if you're thinking about, you know, the the right way to to do things, that can that can also yeah feed back into the kind of data that gets collected in the future. If you if you find out there are certain biases in the data that was collected uh, the first time around, um, yeah, then then that's going to be something you're going to want to um, correct for the second time around and collect a more representative data set whether it's air pollution or whether it's some other kind of um, thing that affects humans no i mean you're abso absolutely correct but at the same time we are still in the phase of just monitoring air pollution right like because this is the initial step and this is something very critical if you want to move to the actual stuff that is cleaning the air right that is the objective but yeah like like you mentioned like getting you know biased data at the very start that that is a very huge like that's a huge problem but at the same time we need to start somewhere it's better to get get data rather than not get some data rather than not get data at all like there are still places around the world we do not have enough maybe not enough enough is not the right word maybe we don't have any sensors at all in the open so we don't even know what is happening there uh, so it's very important to get this kind of measurement so that we can actually progress to you know the actual stuff that is cleaning the air <laughs> absolutely yeah so you can have the uh, the outcome of the research be um, a positive impact all right well um thanks for uh, joining us on the on the podcast uh prithvi subo and christina um before uh, we let you go um can i ask each of you um do you have social media that people can follow? Uh, and if 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 you do or if you don't, uh, where can people learn more about your research online? Uh, I'll go to Prithvi first. Yeah, so I'm available in Facebook, Twitter. Uh, what's your What's your Twitter handle? Uh, I'll send you the link or something. <laughs> Will that be we'll easier? We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, Supo, how about you? Um. Yeah. Uh... Uh, my Twitter, Twitter handle is sbmisi, and um, you can reach me out uh, there. Um, I have a LinkedIn page as well, as well as a personal website. So, yeah, I can provide the links for those things. And what about you, Christina? Um, well, you can reach me when I do a Twitter takeover of the Reg Twitter, um, but also on my personal Twitter. For our listeners' benefit, Christina, I know what you mean by the Reg, but what's the Reg? The Reg. The Reg is um, the research engineering group at the Turing Institute, also known as Hut 23, the place that Alan Turing uh, himself uh, was at Bletchley Park. 
So uh, I think our handle is Hut23 on Twitter. It's Turing Hut23. So T U R I N G H U T 23. In fact, we often promote the podcast there. So that is, it, it, we probably should uh, get people to follow that on every episode. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. If you, if you want to hear from more about us and the research that's going on at Turing, um, then that's, that's the account to follow. Um, so yeah thanks again uh, Prithvi, Subo and Prasida for coming on the podcast thank you thanks a lot Uh, thanks for listening to this week's episode the Turing podcast is produced by Dan Whitfield for the Alan Turing Institute the show is hosted by me B. Costa Gomez Ed Kalstry Joe Dungate Christina Last and Anika York music for this podcast is produced by Jam and Sun You can listen and follow via the link in the description or by searching Jam and Sun on Instagram.